warmest of welcomes. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's sing our first hymn. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. Remain seated as we sing.
our Heavenly Father, we could desire a thousand tongues to sing your worthy praises. And what a voice and Lord and what a sound that would be. But Father, it wouldn't even be enough to sound your precious praises. Father, we thank you that you are worthy. We thank you that you are worthy of far more than we could ever give you. And your Son is far more worthy than we could ever imagine. And your Holy Spirit is worthy more than we could ever think. Oh, we bless you that you're a gracious God. We bless you that you're a holy God. And we praise your name. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. We thank you for our Redeemer. We thank you for the one that brought back salvation for us. Lord, we thank you that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Father, we thank you that when we were in the clutches of the devil. O oh Lord, when the God of this age had blinded our minds, we thank you that when we were dead in trespasses and sins without God and without hope in the world, we thank you that you stepped in. We thank you that you so loved the world, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our oh, Father, it is worthy of an eternity and more, if there could be, of praise to Jesus. Father, we thank you for the great Lord who came willingly to this earth, who suffered so terribly, who rose again so victoriously, and will come again majestically. Father, we bless you for our Saviour. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you incessantly for the great work he achieved at Calvary. And we pray for your blessing as we think again upon your Son. We thank you for him. And we pray for every aspect of our time this evening. We ask for your hand of blessing to be upon it. We pray, Father, for our prayers and our reading. And for the ministry of your word and the hymn later on. And then as we gather around the Lord's table. For those who have known you. For those who have testified to this. To those, O oh Father God who you have called by your grace. And oh, it's such a privilege. Lord, we don't come to the table tonight because we must. We must. But Lord, we come because we may. We come because, oh Lord, we want to come. We'll come tonight, oh Father, please, because we want to remember that event of all events. And Father, there are so many events that are forgotten. But oh, may this never be forgotten. May this event of all events, this most momentous of all occasions, when Jesus died for sinners, be ever remembered. Oh, my soul, may every idol be forgot. But oh, my soul, forget him not. Father, we do pray that we would never forget the Lord Jesus. That great, great sacrifice that he achieved on Calvary's hill. Father, we thank you that he washes away our sins. And we pray tonight that you would give us renewed focus and renewed emphasis upon the Lord Jesus. Bring home again what it meant for our Lord Jesus to suffer and to bleed and die. And Father, we pray for ourselves this evening. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us our sins. We pray that you would have mercy upon us. Thank you that he breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. We thank you for that blood of bloods, O oh Lord. That precious blood of the Lord Jesus that washes away all our terrible sins. Oh, Father, be with us then. We pray that we would ever thank you. We ask for prepared hearts. We pray for thankful hearts. We thank you, Lord, that you've kept us in health we thank you, O oh God, that you've kept us going. We thank you for all your providences in our lives thus far. We do raise our Ebenezer and say, thus far as the Lord helped us. We say that individually. We say that in our families. And we say that as a church fellowship this evening. We thank you for this fellowship from our hearts. We thank you, Father, for days gone by. We thank you for blessings upon blessings. Father, we thank you for the 200 years of this church's existence. 
We thank you so much that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been faithfully preached time and again from this pulpit. And we pray for your blessing. Oh, Father, we come to you and we pray earnestly that you would guide us and lead us in the future. You know that we've been through unprecedented days with this pandemic. And Lord, we're not out of the woods yet, as we've said. But Father, we pray, almighty God, that you would lead us coming out. Oh, Father, you've been faithful to us throughout it, Lord. And we thank you for your promises. And we thank you that you know, oh Lord, your thoughts toward us. Thoughts of peace, oh Lord. And we praise you that you've upheld us and governed us and guided us. And oh Lord, we pray for the future. We ask, oh Lord, again, that you would please undertake. We pray that we would see souls being transformed by the life-changing message of the gospel from the young up to the old, Lord. We praise you that the message is still the same and it may be conveyed in different ways. But Father, we pray for, for our future, Lord. We ask that we would commit it and commend it to you. We pray that we would be sensitive to your leading and your guiding we pray once again for a week on wednesday as members gather we praise you that you've given the mind of christ to believe us father your word tells us and we pray for the mind of christ on that occasion as we gather father help us we pray give us wisdom lord we haven't got the answers on ourselves we don't we don't know lord we pray that that you would truly reveal what you would have us to do father we pray for your grace watch over us this evening father we pray that you would minister to us and encourage our hearts for we pray it in the name of jesus amen let's open our sheets to genesis chapter 21 genesis chapter 21 and reading from verse 8 to the end of verse 14, and then we'll be going into Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 21 to verse 31. Genesis chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Let's hear the word of God directly after Isaac was born. So the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she bore to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water, and putting it on his shoulder he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And then in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. 
Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And we look to God to bless us in his word. Let's now again pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray that you would reveal it to us. We ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit would breathe upon the word and that you would instruct us and guide us in the ways of righteousness. We thank you that the Lord Jesus promised when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth through a take of what is mine and declare it to you. And Father, we pray that the truths of the Bible would sing deeply in our hearts. Help us, O oh God, we pray, be with us. Father, we do pray for those in our church. Lord, we pray especially for the youngsters who will be going back to school this week. We pray that you'd give them grace and blessing after the summer break. We pray for George and Lydia as they go back in the early part of this week. And also for Harry as he goes back to school on Wednesday. That you'd greatly bless these young lives. We pray that you would be near to them. Be with them in whatever year they go into next we pray for this beginning of a new academic year for them may they learn much oh god we pray that they will have education for life and that you would be with them and give them grace as they seek to get back into learning so very needful and we pray that you would be with and give common grace to the teachers and so on that instruct children we pray lord for the difficulties of, of the COVID and everything else, oh God, and we pray that the issues wouldn't be there. We ask that you would please cause people to be safe. And Father, we do ask for young people that they would come to know the Lord Jesus. Most of all, we pray that they would remember their creator in the days of their youth. We pray, Lord, for those who are feeling apprehensive and nervous. We ask, oh God, that you would settle them and that ultimately we would find our trust and our reliance on the Lord Jesus. We pray that we would be found in him. Not having our own righteousness. But the righteousness which is from Jesus. Father we do pray for those O oh Lord who are ill. We pray that you would be near to them. We ask that you would give grace and, and blessing. And Father, we also pray for those who are on family duties this evening. We pray that you would uphold them where they are. For Liz and for, for Lucy, that you would give them encouragement and that you would help them and be with them. We do pray for mothers in our fellowship, Lord. Give grace and help in this high calling, we pray. And that you would help them in this God-given task to be godly and to be holy. Father, we pray for fathers we ask that we would be godly fathers and that we would instruct our children in the ways of righteousness, whether young or old. Father, we pray for those of our family that are unsaved. Oh Lord, we bring them to you. Lord, it, it breaks our hearts when our own blood and kith and kin haven't bowed the knee to the Lord. And although many prayers have gone up and many a, a message has been preached in their hearing, but yet, Lord, we know it's of you. And so therefore we commit them to you wherever they are this evening and pray, Lord, that in your time you would draw them to yourself and that they would be born again of your spirit. Father, we pray for ourselves now as we come again to your word. Give us help, Lord, we pray. Perhaps the closing hours of another Lord's day and we may be soporific perhaps, Lord, or we maybe have a lack of energy, Lord. We pray that you'd give us a stimulation in our minds and our hearts and our souls, preacher and hearer alike, and that we would learn of you and that you would be near to us. Hear us then. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. We started last Lord's Day by looking at the life of Isaac, a very significant life, important in many ways. God is the God of Abraham, yes. He's the God of Jacob, yes. But he's also the God of Isaac. The God of Isaac. We noticed that he was a promised child. God came to Abraham on a number of occasions and promised that he would have a son. It was like pieces of a jigsaw that were being put together and finally the jigsaw was complete and against all natural means in, in one sense Isaac was born 
incredibly. Sarah was beyond the age of childbearing. She was barren, and yet she produced a son, Isaac. We also notice that this was a parallel to the Lord Jesus Christ, that Isaac is a type of the Lord Jesus. Many ways in which Isaac typifies our dear Lord and Saviour. And many lessons that we can learn in our own lives concerning this child and, and this man, Isaac. We come on to a new event tonight and we look at it with three points and we're first of all going to notice the context The context. And then secondly, we're going to see the contrast. And then in the third place, we'll notice the covenants. The significance of this event. So first of all, then we notice the context. So Isaac has been born. And there's issues of of culture, which some cultures still do. They wean their children at three years of age. That's very, very late for our culture. We're told today that we need to start weaning our children after six months. We begin to introduce finger foods for them. But for this culture out in the Middle East and certain cultures even today, it's a lot later when children are weaned. And Isaac is about three years of age. And it was obviously a big event for Abraham, his father. And again, there's cultural issues that come into play. And Abraham makes a great feast for the family. A great family occasion. Our child is weaned. It was a celebration of the fact that he got to three years of age. We celebrated Jemima's three years. And we don't think too much of it. Back in the summer, but in that culture, three was very important because there was a lot of infant mortality. And so to get to three years of age was a big thing in one sense. They didn't have the medical advances that we have today. And so there was many cot deaths and many infant mortalities. And so three was an incredible thing. And so that's why you might think it goes a bit over the top for Abraham to make this great feast for Isaac. But it wasn't in the culture. Very important event. Isaac's being weaned. A a great thing. And so Abraham makes a great feast. It's a great family occasion. Like some of our family occasions. Now, some families' occasions are very good and they're very pleasant, aren't they? But I've heard about some family occasions that are not so pleasant and they're not so good and that there can be a family rifts and family troubles when family come together. They say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And sadly, on this occasion, it was one of those occasions where the family are in trouble and there's tension and there's contention in the family. There's Ishmael, who's probably about 17 years of age at this point. His name means God hears because of another incident back in Genesis chapter 16. And he looks at Isaac and no longer is Ishmael the center of attention for 16 years up until his teenage life. He's been the center of attention. They believed for a while that this could possibly be the promised son until God said no. But nonetheless, he's been the one they've thought about. He was born in dubious circumstances. Of course, we remind ourselves that it was Sarah who concocted this plan to engineer things, to try and speed up the process. And so she gave her maid, Hagar, to Abraham. And Ishmael came and might have thought it was okay until God said, no, he will not be the child of promise. And he sees Ishmael, Isaac, and he scoffs at him. In fact, there's a play on words here because the name in the Hebrew is Isaac, which means laughter. So he Isaaced him. He laughed at him, but not a laugh in a, in a good sense, which is what Isaac's name means, but it was a laugh in a bad sense. It was a, it was a scoffing laugh. We're told in Galatians 4, 29, that it was a persecution. It was persecution. He persecuted Ishmael, Isaac. This might not have been the only event in which Ishmael persecuted and scoffed Isaac. And Sarah observes it. What's she going to do, Sarah? Well, he tells Abraham that Hagar... And Ishmael have got to leave. Cast them out. Get rid of them. We don't want them. Don't want them. Here. This is the bond woman. Notice how the language changes. In chapter 16, Sarah calls her my maid. And here in chapter 21, Sarah calls her this bond woman. This bond woman. We don't want, we don't want to know her. Get rid of them. Cast them out. Well, what's Abraham going to think of this? Well, he's naturally distressed. Who wouldn't be? 
We would be, wouldn't we? It was his own son after all. Whatever we think about the circumstances behind it, we would all be like that if it was our own son. It lays heavy upon Abraham. And there are many events in our lives that lay heavy upon us. Maybe family events that overtake us. And Abraham's despondent. He's gone from jubilation. What would be a great event, a great time, weaning his, his child, the promised son Isaac. He goes from jubilation to disconsolation. He's distressed now. And isn't it wise of God that he never sends unalloyed joy in this life? He never sends pure pleasure in this life to remind us that we're not there yet. That we're not in heaven yet. He'll always graciously just, just put in some other things, not to be nasty, but to remind us that there is an eternity. To remind us that this world is not all that there is. And in what should have been a pleasurable event, turns out for Abraham to be distressing. It lays heavy upon him. No doubt he's praying for guidance. And that's a point for us to be praying for guidance whenever we're in distressing times and situations. And he has the confirming voice of God. And isn't it great when we hear the confirming voice of God? When we don't know what to do when we're perplexed, when we're troubled, when we need guidance, to come and hear from God's word and to hear his confirming voice. Yes, this is what God wanted for Abraham to cast out Hagar and Ishmael so that they wouldn't be confused as to who the promised son would be to protect Isaac, to cast them out. And so Abraham, with a heavy heart, cast them out prepares a bottle of water for Hagar and so on and, and puts them out to be a sheep. There's the context of this event. Secondly, we see the contrast because this event is good reading. It's a lovely narrative, isn't it? It's a, it's a good event to be looking at. But we're told in our New Testaments that this has an importance. And that's why we read Galatians. We're not left to guess the meaning and significance of the event. Not left to say, well, that's a nice story and just leave it at that, are we? We've got to see what the New Testament has to say. And isn't it wonderful that God brings to bear his truths in his words? He doesn't just leave it. He brings truths. He explains what things mean to us. He lays it upon the surface for us to understand so we're not left to guess and to, to have a fantasyful interpretation of these events. It's written in Galatians and Paul explains the importance of it. Not just an event. Paul was writing to the Galatians and he's writing to, to churches in Galatia. It's not the church of Galatia, it's the churches of Galatia. There were several in, in this region of, of Galatia. And they had heard and imbibed the gospel, but then they had heard and imbibed false teaching. Judaizers, legalizers, people who are saying, well, you need Jesus, but you need something else on top of Jesus. You need, you need the Jewish rituals. You need the Jewish ceremonies. You need all the ceremonial law. And they're, they're putting them under this yoke and this heavy burden. And Paul has to write what is his bluntest letter. He says, oh, foolish Galatians at one point. Who has bewitched you? He says, chapter 1, verse 6, he doesn't pull any punches, does he? He doesn't mince his words. He says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who has called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who want to trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. The gospel was a stake, and so Paul has to be strong. He, he can't hold back because these group of churches in this area, are, they're being undermined. They're turning away from the gospel to this, to this legalistic gospel, to this keeping of the Jewish traditions. Now, if someone wants to keep up with the Jewish traditions and ceremonies, that might be all right in and of itself, but it certainly shouldn't be a command and it certainly isn't a means of salvation. We're saved by the Lord Jesus Christ alone. We're not saved by traditions. We're not saved by... by ceremonies we're not saved by all the ceremonial laws Christ has come we're not under them any longer and so Paul has to write and one of the ways in which he does it is he uses this event from Genesis 21 to 
Highlight it, to underscore it. He says, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, you who want to be under the Jewish ceremonies, do you even listen to where they come from? That second word of the law there, Galatians 4, 21, is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Torah is law in Hebrew. And he says, don't you listen to where it's come from? If you like the law so much, well, let's speak about the law, says the Apostle Paul. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons. He had more than that, but in this, for this purpose, in this context, he had two sons. The one by a bondwoman. You see, there's a contrast that he draws between the two children's mothers. There's the bondwoman. There's Hagar. She was a bondwoman, an Egyptian. She wasn't a free woman. She was under authority. Whatever Sarah said, she had to do. She was a bondwoman. She was she's not a free lady, lady of leisure. She can do what she wanted. She was a bondwoman. And out of that bondwoman came Ishmael. And there's a contrast between Hagar, the bondwoman, and Sarah. Sarah is the free woman. And so Isaac is born according to to the promise. He's the free woman. Sarah wasn't under any obligations, was she? She wasn't under any master. She was a free woman. And out of that came Isaac. There's a contrast of mothers. There's also a contrast of children. There, verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was according to the flesh. There's a contrast between flesh and spirit which is often made in the scriptures. For example, Romans 8 is a strong one. Therefore now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And here this this contrast is highlighted for us. You see, Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Yes, according to the flesh of the normal laws of procreation, but according to the flesh in this this cocked up scheme, this design scheme. And Ishmael came according to the flesh. But ah, but Isaac, verse 23, he was of the free woman through promise. There's a contrast of mothers and therefore there's a contrast of sons. There's There's a contrast between the flesh and the spirit how we need to be discerning as to what comes from the flesh and what comes from the Spirit. The Bible says we're to test the spirits to see if they be from God. What is this? Does it come from the flesh? Is this just fleshly and material and natural? Or is this from the Spirit of God whenever we come to these issues? You see, these Judaizers were arguing that I'm all right because I'm a natural descendant of Abraham. And as long as I'm a natural descendant of Abraham, I'll be all right. But Paul says that doesn't figure because Ishmael was a natural descendant of Abraham. And he wasn't the son of of promise. He'd be blessed, but not in the same way. He wasn't all right. And so it's easy to think, well, I've been brought up in a Christian family. So easy to think, well, I've got Christian parents. I'll be all right. I'm okay. But the Bible says it's not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God, have to be converted themselves. It's not a matter of just, oh, well, I've got Christian parents, and that'll be okay, that'll see me through. It's not, it's not by that. It's not by blood. It's not by natural family ties. It's by faith in Jesus Christ for ourselves. And so here is the contrast. Thirdly, we see, and more fully, we see the covenants. So there is the context. There's this great waning event. There's the contrast of mothers and sons. And there is the covenants. So what is the point of all this? I mean, so you might have read through the reading and thought, I don't really understand it. Do you have issues like that when you read through the Bible and think, I can't make a head in a tailor. What does it mean? What significance does it have for me today? Well, Paul explains the meaning of it. Verse 24, which things are symbolic? He says they're an allegory. They're an analogy. You know what an allegory is, don't you? A figure of speech. This is like this. And Paul says these Old Testament passages and this event particularly, well, it's got a point to it. It's not just a nice event, a nice story. It's an analogy. It's an allegory. It's symbolic. 
And it's symbolic of two covenants. These two sons of Abraham are symbolic of two covenants. The covenant of works and the covenant of grace. There's the covenant of works, he says. Verse 24. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Zion, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Now we need to say straight away that the, the Lord is not, in this passage, abrogating the Ten Commandments. He's not saying, well, yeah, you go, there it is, from Mount Zion, there, there's the covenant that gives birth to bondage, therefore we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. That's not what he's saying. In context, he's not talking about God's moral law, he's talking about the ceremonial laws. He's talking about the Sionic covenant as a whole. He's talking about other laws that were given on Mount Zion. There were also other laws, other than of God's moral laws that were given. There were ceremonial laws that were given. Laws that we're not under today. So, for example, for a Jew, they can't eat a bacon sandwich. And they can't mix certain, certain cloths and so on. And these legalizers were insisting that you should be under those things. And it says that it gives birth to bondage. It puts spiritual... It puts ourselves in prison. It puts stocks over ourselves, doesn't it? That's what it does. It gives birth to to bondage. Just like Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. And it does. You see, we're not converted by our works, are we? We're not converted by the things we do. We can't possibly be right with God by, by our own endeavors. You've heard of Martin Luther, I'm sure, the great reformer. And for many, many years, he tried to earn favor with God. He was, tried to go into a monastery, tried to set himself up. He thought, well, I don't want the, the, the lust of the flesh, and so therefore I'll put myself in four stone walls to be by myself. And, and I'll try and give myself to prayer. It's a notable aim. And he went down to the, to the priest to confess his sins. And sometimes he was at the confessional booth for six hours at a time, confessing sins that probably the priest didn't realize existed. And then he realized as he was studying the scriptures, particularly in Romans 1, 17, that it wasn't a righteousness that you earn. That it wasn't a righteousness that you somehow have to cobble up for yourself. And he was putting himself under bondage and bondage, wearing hair shirts and doing all kinds of things to be right before God. But he's putting himself in bondage. He's putting spiritual stocks on himself. And he realized it's a righteousness that's given. He realized that it's a righteousness that is Christ that you receive. How we can't do it through the covenant of works. We can't do it. Just like Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. Let's not put ourselves in spiritual prisons by resurrecting old covenant laws that are no longer irrelevant for today. No longer under today. They give birth to bondage, you see. So it's just like natural Jerusalem below, which they were doing. You see, the Jews give precedence to Jerusalem, and rightly so, under the Old Testament. But it's not about places under the New Testament anymore, he says. Verse 25, for this Hagar, he says it represents Mount Zion in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem. That now is, but we're told that there's a Jerusalem above. Verse 26, but the Jerusalem above is free. That Jerusalem in the Old Testament and that important place where every Jew could, could, could go up three times a year and should do to keep all of those ceremonies and, and feasts and so on. He says it's not about that physical Jerusalem anymore. It might be nice to visit it. It might be nice to, to go there. It might be a good thing. It might be educational, but you're no more holy because you've been to Jerusalem than if you haven't. It's not about physical Jerusalem. It's not that somehow if you pray there that your prayers are more likely to be heard than if you prayed in a rubbish tip. Don't figure. It's not about physical Jerusalem and physicalities anymore. It's Jerusalem above. That's what the writer of the Hebrews says when he says that we've joined the company of the spirits of just men made perfect in the Jerusalem that's that's above. It's the spiritual Jerusalem that we need. That that spiritual place of, of, of heaven. You see, that's the covenant that we're going after. You see, there is a connection between us and Isaac. What does he say? Verse 28. Now we brethren, he's still calling them brethren, he's still affectionate even though it's a blunt letter, isn't it? He says, now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. It's relevant for us, is Isaac. 
That just as Isaac was born physically through promise, we are born spiritually through promise. In a spiritual sense, that just as Abraham was Isaac's father physically, we're told that we're like Isaac in that we have Abraham as our father spiritually. Abraham is our father. He had the gospel preached to him beforehand, we're told. Chapter 3, he argues this to Paul in Galatians and he explains to us that Abraham is the father of all those who believe. In fact, he's very strong in chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So I'm about to try and find some descendant. The Jews will try and find it, some link. Some, so as long as we have Abraham as, as our father, then we've got to be all right. But oh, but we have Abraham as our father. Why? Because we have faith in Abraham's son. Because Abraham becomes our spiritual father. He said, oh, Lord Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Abraham's the father of the faithful. And when we have faith in Abraham's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately, through many generations, but through that line, the promised Messiah that was given all the way back to Abraham. Abraham believed him. He had the gospel preached beforehand. And when we have faith in Jesus Christ, then Abraham becomes our spiritual father. There's a connection between us and Isaac. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, we're children of promise. We're children of the Spirit, verse 29. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Even so it is now. And it's true, isn't it? Those people that go after works and those people that want man-made religions and want to go after good works. They persecute those who want free grace. It's not about those who are good works and gives birth to bondage. It's about Christ. We are free in Christ. We have freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he says in chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made you for us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. We're to guard our liberty. If someone comes and oh, says, you've got to follow this rule and that rule and the other rule that's not from the Bible, they have no place. We say no. We don't have to. We don't bind the conscience. We've got no business to bind the conscience where scripture does not bind the conscience. We have no business to put people back into yokes of bondage when the scripture has no business. Now we be careful with our liberties. Yes, we don't want legalism. We don't want licentiousness because he goes on in verse 13 of chapter 5 to say, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We're not to abuse our liberties. We're not to flaunt the weaker brother and all those things. But we're in, in love. We're to serve one another. Be careful with our liberties. We're not to be trampling over other people with them. But we have liberty. We have freedom. See, freedom is not found in keeping laws and ceremonies and rituals. Freedom is found in a person. And it's found in Christ. And it's found in the wonderful living Lord Jesus Christ who died for sinners and rose again. That's where it's found. That's where liberty, true liberty is found. You see, it's sin that imbibes, chains us. He who sins is a slave of sin. And the soul that sins dies. But it's Christ who takes away the stocks. It's Christ that opens the prison cell. It is Christ who, who dies and rises again for us. Where are you this evening? Are you a child, as it were, of, of bondage? Hoping like Luther was before he became converted? Hoping that just maybe we, we might through our own good works and through this what we do and that what we do and the other thing that we do, hoping that that's going to bring some acceptance with God. Somehow, as many religions in the world teach, just try and try and maybe, just maybe, the Lord may be favourable to us on that day. No, it's bondage. Or are you a part of that true covenant of grace? 
that says Christ has done it all. It's not about doing, it's about what Christ has done. We go to the finished work of Christ. We go back to him. We trust in Jesus Christ who alone gives freedom. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And true liberty is found in Christ and in Christ alone. And found in his finished work at Calvary's cross. That's where liberty is found. In the glorious Lord Jesus. It's him. It's Christ. It's the wonderful saving work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Are you free tonight? Are you at liberty in him? We pray when we sing, set our hearts at liberty. Are you at liberty this evening? Through the great, wonderful saviour. If so, spiritually, we are therefore like Isaac. Let's sing our last hymn. Before we gather around the Lord's table, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. other than the Lord Jesus Christ and on him alone. All other ground is sinking sand. May we not build on it on laws of legalism and ritual and ceremony, but oh Father, may we build it on the strong foundation of Jesus Christ and of him crucified. Father, we pray that every one of us would be found in him, not having a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness which is given in Christ. We pray that you would prepare our hearts now as we gather around the Lord's table and as we remember that wonderful Saviour 
who died to set us free, who died to take away those spiritual chains that bound us. Oh, Father, we thank you that we have liberty in Christ. Prepare our hearts, therefore, in Jesus' name. Amen.